Hey folks, welcome to another episode of the wild and wacky world of the security table. And you can only see the five minutes after we hit the record button, well, up until now, as far as what just what just went down, what just happened. But unfortunately, due to content restrictions and YouTube rules, we're not allowed to play that part right there. But uh, I'm Chris Romeo, joined by my good friends Izar Terendash and Matt Coles. And we talk about all things security around the security table. And so I kicked a hornet's nest, which I've become fond of doing now. Um, But I kicked a a hornet's nest real good. And so we're going to talk a little bit about this post I put on LinkedIn and just kind of the reactions that we got from some different people, as well as Matt and Izar's perspective on this. So um, I put a post out a couple of days ago, and we'll put a link to it in the show notes in case you want to jump in. And the premise of the of the post is the hamster wheel of scan and fix. And so my my <laughs> premise is that in application security, we are on this hamster wheel of scan and fix. And so I started thinking about, okay, where did we get this from? Like, why do we have this pattern of tooling that is a scan something and then generate a list of 10,000 different things that have to be fixed? And so I started thinking about, okay, what's the earliest tool that we are aware of in AppSec? It's SAS, Static Application Security Testing. But SAS didn't create this pattern. Vulnerability scanners way before SAS created this pattern of let's scan something, let's generate anywhere from 100 to 100 million results, and let's put it into a list and send it to somebody. But SAS is really where it it kind of entered the picture from uh, the AppSec world, AppSec perspective. And so... I think this pattern is is just wrong. I think it's just broken. And I think we've seen a history of the challenges that this following this pattern does in working with developers. And so I started thinking about, is AI the answer? Can I get an AI bot that will create a PR and fix my problems for me? I'm still doing scan and fix at that point. It's just fancy robot fixing. So I don't think that's the answer. Is RASP IAS, the pattern of RASP and IAS, which I think of as view a request and then block it or allow the request. Could we do SAS inside the runtime? And then I start thinking about that, like, nah, I think because of performance issues and just the strangeness of where we place that control. And then my last thought was, do we do this in the IDE? Like people have been talking about forever. Does that get us close enough to the developer to fix the problem? Uh, and so with that, I think I've, I've, I've spent enough time setting up what this post was And it's funny what happens when it's a Thursday night and you have to write something or a Wednesday night, you have to write something for a weekly newsletter (laughs) and then you can't think of anything. And so I literally went and do you guys know Travis, um, what's Travis's last name for resource that Travis McPeak was at Netflix. Um, He had a post that basically said scan and fix is wrong. And I'm like, yeah, let me write some more paragraphs that go with that. And all of a sudden I had a, a, a hornet's nest that I kicked. So all right, what do you guys think? What's your reaction to this? Do you think Matt's giving me that look when Matt was like, he, he's ready to, to, to fight over this? So I love it. Let's go. I, I want to see Izzar's, hear Izzar's response first because, uh, yeah. So <laughs> the year was 1990X, right? And the thing coming out was Saint and Satan. I forget which one came first. Saint. Dun, uh, Dun Farmer and uh, Vitsi Venema. And all of a sudden, everybody started looking around their Unix boxes and seeing these this processes that were scanning them from the outside and checking for open services. And all of a sudden, all this buffer flow thing and all kinds of different things and checking for configurations. And this thing is too permissive and that thing is too open. And that, that was actually the first time that I, that I met uh, uh, Scan and Fix. And then a bit later on, we, I worked with a, a good friend of ours in a, at a company called Netect, creating a scanner called Hacker Shield that was doing basically scan and somebody please come and fix. And that was 1997, 8, 9. Something like that. And uh, that's when I started uh, <laughs> building my own, what the hell is happening here of the, the scan and fix thing. And very quick, it, to me at least, it became clear that it was 
uh, uh, double quote solution to the problem of, again, a black art needing to be made available, commoditized, and the constant search for a silver bullet. Me as me as a network engineer, me as a as a system administrator, I want uh, this tool that I point in the direction of my my box. I, I click a button and it gives me out a list of things that I need to fix in order to be secure. And that gives me psychology psychological safety on a, on a bunch of different things. First of all, I have the imprimatur of a tool, a recognized tool that was written by people who know their stuff that actually comes and says, this box has been scanned. And uh, I can go to sleep at night knowing that somebody who knows more than me took a look over me. Then I have the psychological safety that uh, I don't have to assume the responsibility because the tool itself is responsible for what it says. And if there's a problem down the road, they can always point, point at the tool and say the tool didn't tell me that. Because at that time, and, and even today going forward, that kind of knowledge is not immediately available. So you're basically hiring an expert in, in that scan cycle. And then there's the fact that uh, it, I, I think, and I, I could be wrong, but I think that it's much more natural for a, a, a human being to produce something, focusing on those things that interest them, and then putting it on the table and telling people, now somebody who knows more than me about other things, come and look at it and tell me what needs to be different. So the, the scan and fix, to me, it's something that came, that, that fit very well in that model of first I build and then I test, first I build and then I bought all the security. And um, e e even if we look at the at SAST, Way back in the day, I, I don't remember the name of the scanner. It wasn't ISS. It was something else. But uh, it, it would go over a, a C program and basically just tell you, hey, you're using MemCPY here or, or things like that, or, or even uh, Microsoft's... Uh, you're thinking of rats, hmm? prob rats probably, or Fluff. Right, yeah, rats, rats, rats. And uh, then there was Microsoft with the include... What was the name of the include that you could give and uh, when it compiles? Uh, the dangerous functions. Um, dangerous yeah. functions. Elaborate. Yeah. And, and and then uh, band, just... band .h, I think it was. Right, and then uh, uh, GCC started including some stuff in its in its warnings about security. Right, but that that was later in the thing. But uh, so so it wasn't even SAS. It was first like the the network scanner, the thing that looked out from the box. That started, in my opinion, the whole in my memory, the whole uh, uh, scan and fix cycle. And uh, SAS only came came later. And and mm -hmm. we could we could even say that these were the first forms of DAS, I think. Right. I I, I remember bugs like the the Palmito bug that went against uh, Pro FTPD. Jordan Ritter found it in I think ninety seven ninety eight. And it was already doing the whole handshaking. And then at, at a later time in the, the protocol, it would do the, the, the buffer overflow. So you could say that that's an early form of test, extremely focused at, at that specific, what became later CV, but but test. So I, I think that in, in your writing, you, you pulled SAST as the first thing. So I, I just think that it's like, it's the other way around and that matters. Exactly because of the thing that I have my box, I point something at it. It says that I'm okay. I can go to to, to sleep, fine. Yeah, but those those scanners in those early days were vulnerability scanners, right? Like Nessus without was being not, called so. Nessus was not a DAST. It wasn't testing application level issues. It was testing for. It, a lot of times it was looking at a banner and saying this banner says 1.85. Right. Hence, there's a port there's a vulnerability in 1.85, right. and you got right. a problem. There's a port right. detector, the example, a vulnerability scanner, and a configuration scanner. But the example of, uh, <clears throat> sorry, the Palmito bug, the, the Pro FTPD, FTPD, as implemented in Hacker Shield, for example, already put you much closer to a DAST because it was actually building a, a payload, exercising the, the protocol, and then inserting the, the payload. So it was okay. later on. It wasn't just checking the version and saying, oh, the version looks slow, so you have... You, Maybe you have this thing. So uh, 
I think that my point is that uh, it, it started from looking from the outside in. It moved into looking at the code as it gets written. And then it got deeper and deeper and deeper in the code as it's compiled, as it's running. And then we got to where we have today with, with Rasp and Yast and all the good stuff. Yeah. And, so, uh, can, can I get a word in there twice? Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for the thank you for the history lesson. I I, I just want to highlight. I, I think we're we're it's the history lesson is great. I hundred percent agree with you. I think and you touched upon this, but I think it's really important just to reiterate this. Uh, at least I I think on this side of the fence of this argument is that um, the tools themselves uh, are not the problem. The tools are a, uh, uh, an easy scapegoat for why the tools exist, why scan and pat, scan and fix as a cycle exists. It's, it's similar to the quality problem, right? Developers are not infallible. Designers are not infallible. You have to have a way, a scalable way of um, analyzing a system for defects, whether you're looking at quality or security and tooling automation helps with that. Part of the problem is the tools have gotten very noisy over time. So I want to, I'm going to be careful and I try and form this properly and, and table that for just a moment, but I'm going to introduce that concept of noise in these tools. We have a need for building quality in, we have a need for building security in. The way we do that is either we ensure that what gets written is secure. And in order to do that, we have to do analysis, right? Or we have to have very defined patterns, but because we want developers to, to, have, to bring their intelligence to bear and their creativity to bear, we don't make everything cookie cutter. And so you have to have a way of analyzing code, looking for security in insecurity patterns. You have to have a way of looking at components, looking for components that have vulnerabilities. And due to, in part due to complexity of, of the systems we're looking at and the noisiness of these tools, this problem of, I have so many things now to look at. What do I patch first? And then I have to keep iterating and iterating and iterating. So it drives a, it drives a organizational pattern and it drives a program pattern, program process pattern that utilizes the tool in this iterative approach. And so I think that's, that's fundamentally the problem of why, why there's this perception of a hamster wheel of scan and fix. But we have a need for this because A, humans are Humans make mistakes. As is are rightly called out, the tool provides a certain amount of assurance, but the tool also brings with it a certain amount of noise. And so we need to overcome those challenges. To that is the tool. No, right? wait. Those challenges are the tool. No, no. Like, no you no, can't no, no, disconnect no. the tool from the challenges in the tool. The tool has the challenges, and so somebody has to build something better. That was my whole point. We need a better pattern. The tools need to implement a better pattern than scan and fix. There's got to be a at, better way. At the end of the day, scan and fix is a response to something existing and to somebody needing to rent knowledge, right? If, and by the way, if you didn't scan, what would you do? Exactly. So you are renting knowledge. You are renting what was in the head of somebody else that knows that stuff well, who coded that in a certain way that can be used in a tool to figure out those things. So You're renting the head of somebody, I'm going to draw the illustration further, who has forgotten random things in the midst of all the things that they know and tends to see things that don't exist. And, and so it's not, you, you know, you're not wait, renting no, no, a wait, perfect wait, 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 wait. No, 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 wait, 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 wait. Let's look at things the way that they are, not the way that people are saying that they are going to become soon. A scanning tool is basically a decision tree. If you see this, and you see this, and you see this, and you see this, chances are that you have a problem. Now, the, the verbosity of them is erring on the side of caution. It was decided at some point that it was much better to let people know there might be a problem than to shut up about it and be bitten by it. The problem is that we have so many chances now for problems to appear 
Mm -hmm. And we have so much complexity in the way that those problems may appear that the amount of uh, alerts at all different levels, right, mm -hmm. is ridiculous. So rather than break the pattern, which I still see as a pattern that does have value, especially as the knowledge that we have to rent gets better and better. I think that going to what Matt said, it becomes a problem of prioritization. Now, that prioritization, again, in my opinion, could be completely wrong. A huge part of it is con contextualization. And contextualization will only come from knowing what are you scanning and what's the environment that that thing operates in or lives in. And that's when you take a step back from the scan and fix to the let's understand the environment where this thing that I am scanning lives and look at other factors that all of a sudden may inform, contextualize, and reach all the different aspects that I have that my scan is providing me and that the rules are acting on top of to actually give the customer the top things that they have to deal with. Does that make any kind of sense? And by the way, if it wasn't scan, I mean, so if it was manual code review instead of SAST, we would still have the same problem, right? With the added problem that you are not renting recognized knowledge, you, you are trusting the knowledge that you have in place. Well, and you'll probably have to hire a ton of people to scale to the level that you can execute a tool over. Mm, same thing well. for looking at a, at a you know pattern matching rules for vulnerabilities you know, looking at a component inventory or looking at uh, a system and doing fingerprinting of binaries and looking and doing manual matches, right? The tool replaces the human. Automation always pr improves productivity because it does better what a human can do by hand. It does it faster, usually. Hold on. It does it better, usually. Hold on. So if we had enough experts, let's do a little thought experiment here, okay? Yep. If we had, let, let's just assume we have un, unlimited experts. And unlimited decades. money because you'd have to pay, pay them all, right? Yeah, but the, this, the thought experiment isn't considering money. It's <laughs> considering the, it's good. Well, because you said. Forget the, the challenges the, here. Just to, you know. No, no, no. You said, Mo, you, what you said was automation is always is better than manual. Effectively is what you said. Oh, and so my yes. point is, if I had an unlimited number of, of experts, automation would not be better than manual. If I had an unlimited number of of uh, Jim Manicos who know a lot about coding, secure coding in a lot of different languages that could look at the code and we had unlimited time, would the would uh, uh, army of Jim Manico clones come up with better results than running a SAS tool? That depends. Does the SAS, does, does the SAS tool has the same decision tree in their mind that Jim Manico would have? I don't think any, I don't think any SAS tool at this point has the decision tree that's in Jim Manico's mind. Just because so, he's experienced things, like SaaS tools don't experience things. They're just they're just rules where somebody tried to capture something and tried to uh, so, make it yes. so that it's not so noisy and so. so for any given, what you're saying so for any given rule set, sorry, uh, for no, any no, given no, rule no. set, for any given rule set, the tool is going to be more efficient at executing that rules than an army of humans. Because humans will be will almost certainly miss something, even if the so you're rules assuming are that you can you can load that engine with the rules that are in Jim Manico's head. No, we are assuming the fact that given that all, let's go philosophical here for a second. Given <laughs> that all humans are, are fallible, and tools are made by humans, tools are fallible. Mm -hmm. Now, the in, in your thought experiment, you say if I had an infinite amount of Jim Manicos. It could be argued that given the same input, an infinite amount of Jim Manicus would produce the same output all the time because he himself has his own process. And I, I really hope, Jim, if, you, if you're listening to us, it's coming out of love. <laughs> so given the same input, he would produce the same output. Why? Because in his mind, he has a certain decision tree that he uses most of the time and that we are trying to reproduce in our tools. I mean, if you're talking about the same piece of code, yes. I would say if you're talking about scanning different examples of code or having Jim review, an army of Jim's review multiple different pieces of code, he the thing that he could bring to the table that the, the scanning tool can't is experience. His mind can interpret things he's seen before and knit them together and see new things. But, that's the, my, my point is that's, that a tool can't do that. A tool is only as good as the but person. No, 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 no. Wait, wait. If you take SAST into consideration, 
Okay, and and we have seen enough approaches to SAST, and I am by no means an expert or or a researcher in SAST, but you have seen the the grab approach. You have seen the uh, let's interpret the code and play the the tainting approach. You have seen the in the language approach of Perl tainted mode, right? So what they try to do in in a certain way, it's either look for patterns or look for uh, uh, an interpretation of the data coming in and how it gets transformed and what goes out of it. And these are all rule-based at the end of the day. Right. What you're proposing with the experience is, because I have seen many different things, my set of rules is much richer. Correct. That's what I'm, I am. I, so, I, am, I am arguing that point. Exactly. So now, now we come to where we are in, in tech. And I hate to go there, but everybody's going there, so why not go there? Have to go there. Yep. And you train your model, and you retrain your model, and you fine tune your model, and you're going to have an amazing model for that specific use case, right? Because it's it's very difficult to have a very good fine tuned model for the generic case. So everybody's going there. Everybody's saying that AI is the next thing. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have a a lot of uh, a really fun time when I have to sit back and watch an AI-based scanning tool scan the code written by an AI, <laughs> right? It's an infinite loop will be encouraged. And, and not Sorry. infinite loop, but I'm going to enjoy very much that discussion between both of them. <laughs> it's going to be the new Turing test. But uh, <clears throat> my, my, my point is that at the end of the day, we are trying to rent that knowledge and we are trying to duplicate that knowledge in, as Matt said, scalable ways that you can come and apply again and again and again at larger scales. And, and, My point is that okay. we are going to find more and more and more issues and findings, but we still have to prioritize them. And right. for so, that, so, you need contextualization. Yeah. So to break to shortcut this a bit, I think where you're getting with from the hamster wheel uh, post that you made originally was the tools are noisy and they generate a lot of results. And so you have to have, you have to, developers need time to fix. So you have to do scan and fix and scan and fix and scan and fix. The way you solve that is you make you make the results be prioritized, more actionable, less noisy. So reduce false positives. I will try to eliminate false negatives, right? Because that's if you don't catch it in SAS, you're going to catch it in vulnerability scanning, or you're going to catch it in fuzzing, or you're not going to catch it all, and it's going to go out to the field and be reported back to you. And now you have a bigger loop. Uh, and so you need the tools to be smarter because that will reduce the noise and allow the humans to make intelligent decisions about which to fix first. But you're still not going to ever solve the problem because developers are introducing bugs into the system. Until that stops, you still have to have analysis. And yeah. until you, I mean, you, you don't, you don't, if you don't, if you don't do QA <laughs> and you ship but something. Everything, everything you just said about what needs to get better in the tools, people have been saying it for 20 years yeah. and nobody's done it. And it hasn't it's happened yet. But That's wait. why we need a new pattern. That's my whole point, though. That pat I'm saying that pattern cannot be kept to the state that you guys well, are describing. Which, pa it. which pattern? The which scan pattern? And fix, the scan and fix pattern. The scan wait, and fix pattern, more. but not the, not the right, tools. Not the tools. He's going to fall out of his chair. Oh, not the tools. <laughs> <laughs> so Matt, Matt got so close to it. So close to it. So close to it. The thing it's is not that the tool. We, no, it's Go not ahead. the tool. It's not the tool. It's the human. Right. Now, the thing is, we don't have to break the pattern. We have to put the pattern, my opinion, we have to put the, the pattern where it belongs. We have to place the pattern in the bigger pattern of things. Now, we keep designing infinite loops and circles and whatever, okay? And, and snakes well, eating their own tail, yeah, orcs, yeah. whatever, right? <laughs> and and, and, and that's, that, that's the nature of the beast. We, we start with the MVP and we grow to incredible companies. And the thing is cyclical. But Matt said, said, said right, the problem here is that, the, that people are failable and they continue being failable. And if we give them tools and if we change the environment they operate in, they're going to find new ways to be failable at those new environments, right? So it's like... We keep trying to do what, what's the the saying? We keep trying to do idiot proof things, and the universe keeps making better idiots. <laughs> so the, the, we love the, all developers equally, but uh... yeah, yeah. So the 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 point here, and and yes, I am going to go there. I am going to go there. 
I will get there. Uh, the thing that's going to break, no, the thing that's going to put that loop into its place and make things better is only that tool that we all know and love that says, why don't before you do something, you look into it and you see what could go wrong, right? If only, because, if only had a, we had a, a solution or we had a, look, an idea that would do that. It's, 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 it's where you break the cycle, right? It's, it's where you say, rather than just building my thing, putting it on the table, scanning and hoping that somebody tells me what's wrong, why don't I ask those hard questions first yeah. and I already apply some forethought, right? I could even use the past experience of a scanner, the past experience of uh, YAST, RASP, things that I've seen, threat intelligence, threat hunting, all that input, and say what's next on the next round. And hopefully make things like th th that might help make the, the... But there's another thing, too. We talked about prioritization. Prioritization is not only about pointing at the important things at the top of the list that you have to do first. That's probably the most important part of the prioritization. The other part of prioritization is what do I do with the rest of the stuff? So at which point you start cutting your losses and you say, I accept that risk. And that only comes from understanding that risk and understanding your environment enough so that you can say, those 10,000 things are fine. I mean, and that's the challenge today, right? That, that risk is being accepted. Just nobody's going through in a formal process of doing it. They're just leaving 10,000 items on the backlog that aren't being There's processed. There's a difference between accepting the risk and put, putting it under the, the I mean, they're accepting the it. They're accepting it. They're just not willingly Implic accepting it. They're implicitly yes. accepting it. Yes. They're not making a statement. They're not going, we're accepting all this. But they're accepting it anyway by not, by not, a lack of action is an acceptance of the risk. It's not, because I wouldn't what, go to court and make that argument, but. Because what we are missing today, I think, is the understanding of that risk. And again, the contextualization of that risk in terms of where we are. It mm -hmm. could be that something that's a critic, let's not go there. Yeah, be careful Something there. that's a medium in my environment mm -hmm. could well keep being a medium. And in your environment, because it can be chained with three other mediums, all of a sudden, give somebody the opportunity, the means somebody who has the motive and the inclination to go and do something bad. And at that moment, it becomes a critical. Yeah. So even if CVSS didn't step first and said, it's a critical, panic, panic in the streets. And we should talk about CVSS at some but point. But CVSS here, doesn't actually do that, but go ahead. Oh, no, but it doesn't do that. But that's the way that we decided to use it. That's right. Because we don't have anything better. Yeah. So so let me just add two other things to that that, that list of stuff. So... We, we probably, in order to help reduce this problem of volume noise, right, is we need to look at um, one, one probably obvious thing is we need our tools to be smarter in that we need to stop looking at, we need to maybe reduce our reliance on purely signature-based findings, yes. right? So simply, do you use GetS or SprintF is a lot of volume, right, in old legacy code bases. But is that necessarily effective? Probably not, because it, it misses all the control flow and data flow information that, that and, and the, those are the other stance, you know, analysis techniques that, that, that were pioneered over the years and around SAS to get better accuracy on results so that a single finding wasn't just simply, oh, look, you use a, you have, you have a variable called password, therefore you probably have a problem with clear text passwords. No, I have a variable that has a password that goes into a, a UI element in plain text. That's a password problem and you know in plain text problem. So you get contextual information. So we have to we need our tools to be a little bit smarter in providing actionable, valid results, not simply you have OpenSSL, you know, 098A, you have a you have a vulnerability, all, all these other vulnerabilities, right? So very basic signature things we probably need to reduce. The other piece we need to we need to consider there, maybe a little bit more um, uh, aggressive and or unpopular, will be take developer choice and lessen lessen full developer choice today. How many GitHub projects are there of open source code, and and how what guidelines are there for developers to choose mm. what they embed and embed for technology? Yeah, and, then, and that's going to be very unpopular, but. If but, you reduce well, choice, well, let's, let's unpack that before we even go any further. Like, 
uh, Matt is prescribing an authoritarian approach no, to development. I'm talking about putting some guardrails. Okay. On that. That sounds more like what you just it's described. Different. Sounds more like guard, more than guardrails, right? Because you're talking about you're making design decisions for people now. You're not giving them the the freedom to operate. I think of guardrails. They give no, me some no, no, freedom. no, 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 no. It's not what he's doing. By by putting guardrails, he's perhaps limiting the options of choice that you have to use somebody else's work. But he's yeah. not saying change your design or he's which pattern or, or potentially which patterns you implement. But but to a limited set, meaning you 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 don't. I think it's necessary if you if you don't put guardrails on what your choices are, whether it's component selection, technology selection, design patterns, then people are going to just invent stuff new, which requires a lot of effort to get right. We've talked about this in past episodes, a lot of effort to get right and jumps you right into the scan and fix problem because now you're introducing new problems. Now, it's limiting. I and hundred percent, like I said, very unpopular. This <laughs> fan mail, hate mail, whatever is going to come along on this, I'm sure. But you know, if you don't want to keep scanning and fixing, scanning and fixing, you need to limit the ability for vulnerabilities or, or other issues to get introduced to your code base or your technology platforms. Yeah, and this is a way to solve it. I'm not suggesting it's the way, or even necessarily you should go this way. But putting guardrails on 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 choice is a way to solve this. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's, it's a place we, I mean, I, I agree with most of what you're, what you're saying here, but the problem is the reason I, the reason I'm still saying scan and fix this pattern doesn't work is nobody's done it. We've had 20 years of SAS tools and nobody's done what you described. Nobody's made it more actionable. Nobody is, but everybody said, they'll all tell you on a de sales demo. Oh yeah, we, we're all about fidelity of results and we're about limiting false positives and avoiding false, like they all say these words, but here we are still 20 years later with the same piles. There are organizations that have tens of thousands of tickets that just get junked because they come out of the tools, they go in, they get junked. Chris, I, I, I think that uh, we are generalizing a bit here. If you look at SAS, yeah, I'm, I'm going to agree with you. Even though, to be sure, the cycle got complete. We started with Grab. Basically, we are back to Grab now, of course, <laughs> yeah. with AI coming in. But uh, that, that Grab got way, way smarter. But the, 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 the counter example that I want to offer is we started with firewalls. Firewalls that did open and close. This port is open, this port is closed. Fine. Then they got smarter. We started getting packet inspection. Then uh, security got smarter. We started encrypting packets. So packet inspection sort of went the way of the Doro. And then there was a strategic retreat. Let's get back from the firewall. Let's start talking WAFs. So now that traffic is not encrypted, but before it gets to the application, let's apply rules again and check the traffic. Mm -hmm. And then the attackers got smarter and those rules got bypassed. So we did another strategic retreat, and we closed the, the, the wagons around RASP and YAST, and now we are checking at the code level. So now we have that, that whole, let's use SQLI, you have that whole query package, and you can look at it before you actually act on it, okay. or you can alert, or you can have a, an in-app yeah. WAF and stuff like that. And, and that, to me, means that rather than defense in depth, we, we are being forced to bring the defense as close to the crown jewels as possible. Mm -hmm. And what's left to do now is because we are doing it so close to the crown jewels, all of a sudden we have, again, so much context that we can apply on top of those rules to actually be able to say, this is a good invocation of a query. This is a bad invocation of exactly the same query. Mm -hmm. So somebody asking for uh, uh, doing a select on my table of credit cards if it's coming from this endpoint, it's a good one. If it's coming from that endpoint, probably not a good one. Mm -hmm. If I've seen already it coming from that endpoint, okay, just added some data that might influence the way that I think about it, about it being good or bad. And this way, you start building a level of confidence on top of that thing, which, of course, has to be fast enough so that you don't mm -hmm. break the whole thing. But you start building that confidence in a way that's smarter than just coming raising the flag and saying this is a bad query everybody stop we, we have yeah. an incident you, you know this is this this notion of sorry that chris this in, this notion of contextualization actually really interesting if you think about it sast as a general purpose tool needs to run across many types of code bases to look for many types of issues 
with a lot, a lot of context. With no and context. Get, with no context. Not a lot of context. I mean, no runtime. They have no idea what's happening in the runtime. And exactly. That's right. Because it's not dynamic. It's static. It's sassed. Mm -hmm. Right. It's looking at code. It doesn't know necessarily what that code is used for. It knows that that how the code is structured. And it can analyze and say, oh, this is C code and it does a certain set of things, but not that it's going to live within an IoT device or an enterprise server or a desktop app or mobile app or whatever. It doesn't, it may not know that. It, some of the tools sort of know that at a great, in a, you know, a macro level, but, but not generally. And so, uh, and, or, or it doesn't take action in that regard. It uses it for reporting, but not necessarily for, for analysis purposes. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and so you need, but you need this because developers write code, code goes in so many places. So you have to have these general, today we have these general tools. We could improve that by knowing about the, the target runtime or the target use cases and figuring out how to tell the tool, okay, this is going to be used in embedded devices versus used in an enterprise server. And my network is going to be X, Y, and Z, and this is what it's going to, and then, then you can get that context. But as you ship clo closer to deployment, you're gaining more and more information that you can use in those yes. tools, in those patterns, yeah, yeah. providing context. So RASP is probably a great solution it is. at that level. It is probably a great solution at that level because it has a lot of context to work from. It Why is not necessarily universally, it it's not necessarily universally it accessible. We have, we have. I, I am fortunate to work with amazing people every day who are doing this. So yes, it's possible and yes, it's a route. Okay, so the, the, the point I think is that scan and fix by itself is not a bad thing. It may be badly used, it may be underutilized, and it may generate results that are not optimal. But if you start putting it into context by adding more and more and more understanding of where that scan and fix is happening, sorry, that scan is happening, you're going to have shorter, prioritized, contextualized cycles of fix. So I wanted to separate the scan and the fix, right? And, yep. and in the middle, we have to put an engine that says context. Right. As people say, context is king. And, and we also need to make some other fundamental changes, like stop, sta stop standards development relying on simply the scan as a goal. Yes. Right? So, you know, PCI DSS, I think, uh, you know, still requires scan, scan with a vulnerability scanner on, you know, every 30 days and patch. That's a scan and fix. Right? But that goes to the reasonable security bit, right? You, you do what you can at that moment. It's right. better than not doing it at all. Right. But, but that's something we fundamentally need to change in the industry because people get into that mindset of, oh, I need to run a scanner. I'm going to take the results. I'm going to patch on a priority list from 10 to zero. Right. Again, using CVSS in a way that wasn't intended <laughs> or, or, or rather, <laughs> or making an interpretation of what information you get out of CVSS scores mm -hmm. and severity ratings. Right. And, and doing this prioritization. Oh, 10 is really bad and, and eight is not as bad. And therefore I can wait on those without knowing context about that 10 in, in, in place of the network versus that eight, you know, front end. I, I, you know, that there's additional context information that you don't have when you're making those decisions. Parenthesis, better things are coming with CV CVSS VRB than before, <laughs> which Matt was one of the collaborators in the, in the group. So yeah, I, I, I've been there, I looked at it, and better things are coming. Public preview is uh, is ending. Well, public preview is currently now, and, and hopefully it will be released in the very near future, so available for consumption. Cool. Uh, but again, so, we have to we have to be able to interpret the results and make use of them in a different way than than just simply taking a score and using it as a blind measure of, of insecurity. Let me summarize that what I think I heard, and then I'll give you my final thought. Contextualization then is the argument for fixing scan and fix. Your your argument is scan isn't the problem, it's fix. And fix is a problem because we don't have contextualization. We have too many results. We have too many false positives, too many false negatives. I mean, I, I that, that all makes sense. I agree with it. It's just I haven't seen anything happen in 20 years that's that's getting me closer to that. So like it's tough to say we should stop, we should, we shouldn't think about another pattern when this pattern 
that it has a good that I agree that's a that's a perfect almost a perfect state if you had contextualization and you could get to the point where you gave developers five things. Here are five things that are real things that are at the same level of a RASP finding. Like that's the thing I love about RASP. If RASP detects a SQL injection, guess what? You got a SQL injection because it's inside the app. It's watching it. It's watching it execute and then stopping it before it can do some damage, right? Oh, is it? That's a whole other, that's a whole other. <laughs> don't get me. That's, that wasn't my, my, that wasn't the focus of my point. Um, but it, yeah, I mean, like, so like my, my conclusion though is, yeah, I agree. I would love for all of those things that you guys described to happen. I've been waiting 20 years. Do I have to wait 20 more years in this industry to see it? I don't know if I got 20 more but, years of AppSec left in. Chris, I, I, I have to agree with the way that you put it. I have to disagree with the, not disagree, but I have to raise a bit of a problem here with the fact that you haven't seen anything in 20 years. In 20 years, the, the target has moved a lot. We are not defending the same things that we are defending 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. 20 years ago, you were defending an on-prem, uh, everything in one box, sure. server, doing something. And today you are serverless, in the cloud, multiple clouds per cloud providers, yeah. multiple uh, identity systems and whatnot. I mean, it's chaos. It's chaos. And, and, and how many programming languages do you have to support? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. The runtimes, they, they just but, appear every day. And that doesn't, that's, not, that's not an excuse to have tools that don't, are better. It is. Right? It is. I don't. It is because hitting a moving pieces. target is much harder than hitting a, a static target, right? Yeah. Today, but I with, mean, let, let me put it like this: with what we what we have today, if we were to scan a target from twenty years ago, you would have a very different opinion from the results. But we are not shooting perhaps. at targets from twenty years ago. We are shooting at targets from today. But the point is, we're still doing the same. We, we still have the same approach to how we're scanning a, a piece of code and generating a, a, a series of results. And that's that's my whole point here. Everybody has just bought into, this is how we do. The, you know what the most, one of the most dangerous things is anywhere in an organization, in a team, in anything? Status quo. This is just how we do it. This is how we do static analysis. This is how we do processing results. When you have that happen, that's my whole point though, is that there has been a period of time, nobody has thought about a better pattern because everybody's been like, this is just how we do static application security testing. Look, I, I think that people who today point at Copilot and saying thing, tools like that, writing code together with the developer, are going to save us from scan and fix because the code is going to be perfect beforehand. First of all, they don't know what they're talking about. Second, the code may be perfect, the design sucks. Mm -hmm. So True. again, we, we, we keep looking at the silver bullet. There is no silver bullet. Right. And, and because going to, to... no, to get, to finish your thoughts. Sorry, I, I didn't want to interrupt. No, uh, no, 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 Matt. Go, go so the, the complexity keeps going up. Again, yes. the the boundaries of choice is still infinite, and and I'm not I'm not suggesting we must change that, but but maybe it's something we need to look at, and uh, and so was it garbage in, garbage out. Uh, as you as you build more complex things, your your scope of what you have to analyze for continues to increase, and the things you have to account for change. Right, so containerization and Kubernetes is new, or was new, or you know became new at some point, and so all these things uh, you know need to be accounted for over time. And you don't know, I, I guess, as as an organization that has to make money scanning utilities, whether you're I guess open source projects, you could argue, you could have a developer who's really interested in solving this problem, who could solve it in one use case and then work on the next use case, next use case, because they're volunteering time and not trying to make money off of it, right? And but then nobody's done that because nobody's taken the effort or nobody has the brain power to be able to do it effectively. Or maybe it exists and we just haven't seen it yet, right, in, in scale. So I, I think just because we haven't seen it in 20 years doesn't necessarily mean that it a, can't be done, I would agree with you, but B, is it valuable in doing so? Is it feasible to do so? Um, would anyone use it if they did? Uh, the other thing I would just add on the garbage in part was, uh, is if we have a concerted effort as CISA and others are trying to do uh, more recently around doing things like memory safe languages, where developers can't introduce certain classes of issues, you reduce the problem set. You start reducing that complexity and reducing the the infinite choice problem. 
right? You cut off a class of er errors. You don't have to scan and fix for those, right? If you solve design problems at design time and you architect a system appropriately, you're cutting off a slice of things you have to scan and fix for. Yep. If you start reducing the set of components or technologies that you use, you cut off that slice and you can reduce and then add context to the things that are left. And now you've reduced the problem. You're still scanning. You're still fixing. If somebody can build a much new more pattern, natural. if somebody can build a new pattern and comes up with something innovative, I don't have to scan and fix it all anymore. There'll be something else. Hey, less CWs, less CVUs, right? If you, if, you, if you can solve, if you can solve how quality assurance works, because this is hey, exactly, this is quality assurance, right? Yeah. We just replaced scan we just replaced people doing automated testing with a scanner. Yep. Well, here's my here's my challenge to all the all the entrepreneurs out there. <laughs> Dream up a better pattern and bring it to market and see what happens. I think you're gonna have some some very interesting results. It's the same yep. it's the same pattern. You're just using getting better information in the in the output. It's the same yeah. pattern. You're scanning with context and then you have to fix them. Scan and fix. But Chris, I I, I... Now, now putting my professional hat. What Matt said is, is compounded by a lot of different things. The complexity that's going up, it's not only the security problem that goes up. It's all the associated bits of the ecosystem that come together to create what we call today systems that are put in place and have to run at five nines and whatnot. It makes the problem of scanning more complex, it makes the problem of contextualization even more. And then we compound that by the fact that we have so many personas out there who want to use these scanners. And each one of them is expecting a different level of fidelity, of uh, uh, quality, and, and of hands-off work, right? So the, the, the five people set a uh, startup they're expecting a silver bullet that's going to tell them you're doing everything right and you're secure. The company with the, the sock and all that good stuff, they're waiting for something that will help them in their processes that they developed in-house, that work for them, that match their organization. Yeah. And that added the uh, challenge of being able to serve <coughs> all these different parts of the public in the way that they expect to be served and not having to tell them a story saying, Here's what I'm offering you, and here's why I think that this is the right solution for you. It, it, it's it's mind numbling. Yeah, I mean, and my, I, there's, all there's, I'm asking for a, is I'm asking for somebody to dream up something better. There is like, a pattern, would, but five a, five or ten years ago, we would have never. If someone would have suggested that you could do something in the runtime, everybody would have been like, "No, no, no! There's it's not possible." There, there no, is a, Rasp and Rasp there and I asked in runtime observability. There's are, a reason are, for that. Are a big is, part of what we do. There is a though, pattern. Is our... There is a pattern that solves this. Okay. Nah, 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 <laughs> nah, 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 nah. Let the record show for those listening on but, audio. It's his Matt's card said Ada Misra formal analysis. You limit but choices. even before we go there, you even limit choices, we... <laughs> and you you limit choices, and you make everything uh, you you design in perfection as best as possible. Yes, and ninety nine point nine 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 percent of developers out there would not be able to live in those conditions. But that's right, Chris. You, you say a couple of years ago, looking at the runtime, and and Matt is going to, to correct me here, and he's going to jump at it. <laughs> we had very serious limitations, even at the hardware level that would not let you effectively look at the runtime. Mm -hmm. We did not have the tools of observability that we have today. We did not have the, the, side the, the proper side channels that we have today that give you insight on that, mm -hmm. right? We didn't have the tools that would let you look at runtime. Runtimes that emitted enough signals mm -hmm. to be able to tell someone, mm -hmm. here's what's happening inside me. We're seeing that problem with AI today. People keep saying, we don't know how we get into these results. Why? Because AI is not emitting enough signals that say, here's yeah. where my thoughts are. And, and yeah. by the way, and we still have this problem today with, with certain types of systems, right? Small embedded devices, IoT devices, consumer electronics, right? Who's, how do you get that observability data out of somebody's refrigerator if it's disconnected from a network? I mean, my, just my point was we had a pattern. We didn't have a pattern. And now we have multiple patterns, like the observability became a new pattern. 
So all I'm saying is I think there's another pattern out there. I wish I knew what it was because if I did, I would just start a company and make a billion dollars and I'd be done. So I'd be, I'd be retired on a golf course. But I, all I'm saying is I want to challenge people to think up another pattern. Like what's wrong with another pattern? What if, what if somebody quick does, came up with something and it was better than scan and fix? Would you <clears> still <throat> argue for scan and fix? Like yeah, this is better, but I love scan and fix because we've been doing it forever. Uh, let, so let me risk- try. Oh, sorry. Can I just? So, sorry, man. Uh, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, at the risk of being at the risk of being marketing market, marketing oriented here, there is a new pattern. Security observability is coming up. Okay, that there is a lot of solutions that are being uh, uh, set up around that space. There's a, a lot of solutions that are using the tools of observability to emit security signals, mm-hmm. and they're great. But at the end of the day, if you look at what happens with those signals, you end up falling into the pattern of scan and fix. Because you have something, you apply to it rules, and you fix the results. So at the end of the day, scan and fix is not only running a scanner and fixing. It's it's basically check rules and fix. It's not yeah. scan. The, the, the scan is just the way that it happens. Yeah. What's being actually done is check rules and fix. And the only way that we're going to break the, extend that pattern in a way that the fix side of the balance becomes better is by putting the context in the middle. And, and and the last piece I want to throw in there uh, is think about the other. Th- There's one other one other concept that we haven't introduced in this conversation yet is timing. Observability requires a system that's functional. True. Right. And we've talked about we've talked about as an industry over those past twenty years that it's very expensive to to fix something that's in the field. Yeah. Right. So if, at the point you can do observability, you've already shipped it. Or you're ready to ship it, right? So, and, and, and you can sim- you can simulate environments and all that sort of stuff. But you're you're, you're guessing at that point, right? What your user behavior is going to be. And I'm not talking about cloud services. I'm talking about products, systems, things that get shipped to people and run in the real world, right? And so, observability you've already shipped, or you're at the point of shipping. So it's cheaper to fix things earlier in the pro- in the life cycle at design at, and implementation. Of course, we're no longer doing waterfall model of development by and large, but we still have a design, some sort of understanding concept phase and some sort of implementation and and integration phase, and then some sort of deploy. So is it, do we want to break that pattern of find and fix early or allow us to find and fix in the field? But wait, wait, Matt, that that there is, well, I agree with you that there is a, a, a thing here. Observability for security goes exactly the way that you say. Fortunately, people have been using observability for way more things than security. And now we can have the happy surprise of finding out the tools of observability already deployed with all that good stuff, including IoT, right? And we can just reap the benefits of that existing. So it's one of those situations where security has to lift the head out of the box that we live in and say, what else is around here? What what else can I use? And these tools exist and they are at a very, very high degree of fidelity, of, of uh, uh, visibility, scannability, and we can use that information. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, when somebody else comes up with a new pattern, I'm going to call you both and say, I told you so. <laughs> And when they're still doing scan and fix, we'll look at you and go, "Uh uh-huh. I mean, (laughs) mean, and I think there are, but my whole point is like, I want to, I want to put forth, I want to encourage innovation. I want to encourage people to think outside of what we've done. And when I see scan and fix, I see we've done this, we've done stuff this way for a long time. That doesn't always mean that's the best way to do it. It, people, People can get into that rut of this is how we do it. I just want to challenge some of the new thinkers out there, new people in our industry, Try and think of something different. Think of a different way to do that. And, and Matt, you took us on a bit of a journey into guardrails and, and we could include paved roads in that. That's prob- that could be part of a different pattern yeah. where you have more, less choice, but more secure and, le- and, and, and the results are you, you're able to build something that's more secure because you're not giving developers the ability to do anything. Which, let's be honest, in I'm most not, not suggest was not suggesting that at all, but but okay. okay. Well, that's, that's that's what take I it, take that to an extreme. I drew, I drew from take, it, but take but that that's, to an extreme. Absolutely, that would be true. But 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 even putting guardrails in place again, you're reducing the problem set so you make scan and fix a manageable activity. 
Yeah, I want a world. I want a world where we don't have to scan and fix. Yeah, my my that's point is that you won't have a world that you can that you don't scan and fix because you have to break so many other patterns before you get to that world that the only option that you have is scan, contextualize, and fix. Yeah, that's the dog I mean, again. Yeah, and the dog agrees with me. By the way, translation. No, Just I was talking. <laughs> no, it's uh yeah i mean i i just wanna i just wanna encourage people to think think big think bigger <laughs> that's my goal right like at the end of the day i don't care where we land on this but like i just i want to encourage especially new people in our industry think about these things don't just accept the things that we've always done think about new ways to do things and who knows maybe somebody will come up with something that the three of us will look at and go huh just like in threat modeling where someone says a threat and you're like i've been doing this for a long time I never thought of that. That's a really interesting idea. That's my point here is I want people to push the envelope for us. And so that those of us that have been around a long time can look at something and go, you know what? I never thought of that. I didn't even realize that would be possible. (laughs) Exactly. So, all right, folks, thanks for joining us on the security table. And we look forward to another episode next week where we dive into something and get super excited and jump around and and argue about it for up to 45 (laughs) minutes. So thanks for listening to the security table.